All right, so here we go. This is the money shot question. That night, could it have been an accident, right? Could you have killed Madeline by accident? And now let's listen to the response they give because I think this will be a major clue into understanding what happened that night. Almost 20 years later, can we figure out what happened to Madeline McCann using nothing but her parents' own words? I'm a deception detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose liars and manipulators. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to look at an interview that Madeline McCann's parents did with Antenna 3. I've not watched this interview before. It was sent to me by uh, Rodinas Leves, so one of my followers on X. And he says that in this interview, the parents are confronted with a the theory that they used sedatives on Madeline. And he says the answer is fascinating. So that's why I booted up my computer. Let's watch and listen and see if we can figure out where they're lying. And through their leakage, maybe if we can even figure out what actually happened. If you've seen my previous two videos on the McCanns, you know, I think that Madeline died in the bedroom as a result of either getting hit on the head or by having her parents administer sedatives to her because they are both doctors in order to keep her down, help her sleep while they enjoyed their holiday. So let's listen. I feel lonely and um, life's obviously not as happy without Madeline. Um, but, you know, I still have hope. We still have hope. Um, Definitely. Yeah, there's still, she's out there. We believe that. I just feel anxious that she's out there and she's not with us. Estamos aquí para hablar de Madeline, por supuesto, pero yo les quería preguntar por sus otros dos hijos. ¿Cómo están Amelie y Son? ¿Se mantienen al margen de este drama? All right, so this interview is in Spanish. Right, forgive me for my non-fluent Spanish, but it looks like the host is asking them. Uh, let's see. And she's not with us. Estamos aquí para hablar de Madeline, por supuesto, pero yo les quería preguntar por sus otros dos hijos. So he's asking about their other two children, right? So they have a pair of twins. And uh, what's going on with them? ¿Cómo están Amelie y Son? ¿Se mantienen al margen de este drama? ¿Preguntan por Madeline? I mean, they, they do ask about Madeline. Right, so he asks, do the other siblings ask about Madeline? Madeline. And Madeline was very much a big part of their life. Um, and they ask where she is, that they're not upset they're not distressed but they're obviously very aware that she's not there especially being home um and i guess it, it's hard for us as parents to imagine um the fun they'd be having together the three of them if madeline was there um i think the hardest thing for me is when they they say things to us like when is madeline coming back home and you know, we have to say that we don't know, but everyone's looking for her. Yeah, we say that, and now, and now they yeah. say things like we're looking for her, and we're finding Madeline and things. And then, I mean, Emily said the other day, she just said, um, it wasn't to me, actually, it was to my friend. She just said. What's interesting here is if you saw my other two analyses of an interview the parents did five years after Madeline went missing, they were a lot less emotional than they are here. However, they still don't report a lot of emotion. So this is something I posted today because the Madeline's, I mean, sorry, Madeline's parents, right? The McCann's have lots of hallmarks of hoaxers, right? So as you know, if you've binged all my videos, I like to analyze hoaxers and four signs of a hoaxer that you know we've shaped over the course of analyzing hoaxers are these things, right? And I posted this on X. Four signs of a hoaxer are conclusiveness, right? So uh, the McCanns are conclusive that Madeline was kidnapped by a man when 
nothing in the evidence supports that 100%. So it's a red flag, right? So hoaxers are conclusive. Secondly, hoaxers are vague about the money shot. So they're vague about the subject of the hoax, the big part of the story that everyone wants to hear. So for Bob Lazar, it's the UFOs. For um, Chris Grush, it's it's the aliens. Um, for Bob Gimli, it's Bigfoot. So for the McCanns, it's going into the bedroom and discovering that Madeline was not there. But when they talk about that in other interviews, they get very vague. Right? So they're extremely detailed about how far they were sitting from the room or walking up to the room or the time they went to go check the room. But when it comes to actually searching the room, they get very vague. Third is reticence about the money shot. So in other interviews, when people ask the McCann's, well, what happened when you checked the room? They delay talking about that part because that's the big lie, right? That's the part they're, they're lying about. So they slow down the narrative, right? They talk about walking to the room. And then um, the mom didn't even report turning on the bedroom lights, right? When she checked the room, just said, I went in there. Madeline wasn't there. I left the room. I ran out. So they don't want to spend any time in the room because that's where the lie is centered around what happened in that bedroom. And that's why I think Madeline died in the bedroom, just because of the reticence about talking, about them talking about the bedroom. And then this is the most important one regarding what we're seeing here, is hoaxers are emotionless. And by that, I mean, they can act emotional in an interview, or they can be super emotional, right, uh, when they're talking to the press, for example, but they don't report emotions correctly when they're talking about what happened, right? So there's a difference between displayed emotions, which we're seeing here, right? I've, I've never seen them look so sad in an interview. So there's a difference between displayed emotions and reported emotions, where they're talking about the emotions they were feeling or are feeling. And you would expect them to appear emotional and talk with deep emotion if they really do believe their daughter is still out there missing. So just be aware of that. Just because they look sadder here and more weepy, still listen to the actual reported emotions. Because I think you'll find that those will still be lacking. Madeline's coming home to my lovely house and I'm going to share my toys with her. Yo sé que son eh, comparecencias siempre muy difíciles para ustedes. ¿Por qué ahora, después de varios meses... Eh, sin hablar a los medios han decidido romper. And so saying this is difficult for you and why after all this time are you talking to the media? Something along those lines. Silencio. I mean, there's a couple of reasons why we haven't spoken. Um, there's obviously quite a lot that we haven't been able to, to speak about in the last couple of months uh, with circumstances. Um, if I'm honest, I've been a little bit... Um, disheartened, disillusioned with the media. This is something that Kate says a lot, if I'm honest, which is a sign of deception when people say honestly or to tell you the truth or truthfully. It's a little bit of leakage indicating that some of the stuff they say is not true. And I think yeah, this is beautiful. So one of my subscribers actually commented this exact thing on my previous Madeline video. So he noticed 20 minutes in, Kate, to be honest now, meaning she wasn't honest before. A great comment and actually pulled up comments um, where I've commented nice catch on some of the comments you guys have left on previous videos because the comments are so good, right? So I have the best followers, the smartest followers. So here Kate did it again, to be honest. Does someone saying to be honest mean that they are lying no, of course not, right? We need multiple signs of deception to conclude that someone is being deceptive. However, we do take note of it. Media coverage. And also when she says to be honest, that probably means that she's lying. So let's listen to what she said after to be honest and let's start keeping track of that. When she uses that verbal crutch to be honest, 
is what she says afterwards, uh, a lie or truthful based on, you know, what we can understand from the context. So it could be either one, right? It's up to us to figure out what that verbal crutch means. The same way Jada Pinkett Smith has that verbal crutch where she says, you know what I mean? Right. And I have a ton of comments about that and I actually commented on, um, in, uh, my last Jada Pinkett Smith video where when she's telling an unbelievable story about someone pointing two guns at her head, she says, you know what I mean? Loud and, and giggly like that right afterwards. Right. So as far as Jada goes, when she says, you know what I mean? It's usually following a lie. So here we'll figure out what Kate's verbal crutch means. We haven't been able to, to speak about in the last couple of months. Uh, with circumstances um, if I'm honest I've been a little bit um, disheartened disillusioned with the media coverage and I think now I mean you mentioned it's six months and it's it's a long time to be without Madeline and we believe she's out there and we just want to appeal again once more to to the people of Spain, Portugal, North Africa, to help us really. And that's why we've got a new central phone number that people can ring. Um, Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva. I do, maybe even more. So, I... so he said, do you believe that she's still alive? Right, if I'm getting my Spanish incorrect, I'm, I'm getting the gist of it, right? I haven't practice Spanish in depth in a while. Strongly believe that Madeline is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling. Wow. That is strange. Let's listen again. She said, I, I believe Madeline's in someone's house. Um, Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva. I do, maybe even more. So I strongly believe that Madeleine is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling, but I feel, as Madeleine's mummy, I feel in my heart really that she's there. And I don't, I don't believe Madeleine has. Another word that liars use is the word really, so intensifiers, like I truly believe she's alive, or I really think she's alive. When people use intensifiers without any uh, reason to, it usually indicates a secret doubt. So for example, if I say, I, I really didn't steal your bike but you didn't ask me if I stole your bike, that should be a red flag that I may have stolen your bike. However, if I use an intensifier with you after you accuse me, like for example, if you say, did you steal my bike? And I say, no, I didn't steal your bike. You say, are you sure you didn't steal my bike? Then an intensifier is appropriate, right? Like really, I did not steal your bike. I'm being honest, I didn't take your bike. So Kate uses intensifiers when she's not being pressed. So this is a softball interview. It's not like the other interview we saw with Sklavin, where I spent two episodes analyzing that interview, where he was, you know, looking at them a little bit more skeptical, right? He had his eyebrow raised, and he was ans asking them um, slightly more skeptical questions than we're getting here, right? These are softballs, right? Do you think Madeline's still alive? Why haven't you come to the media in six months? So just listen to the use of intensifiers where she's not getting any pushback, it can reveal a secret doubt. That's what intensifiers reveal, right? You always speak based on everything you know. So if you know you're lying, your brain inadvertently may use intensifiers because you know you need to persuade someone because you're lying. Whereas when you tell the truth, as long as you're not telling the truth in response to some pushback, you don't feel that secret need to persuade because you know you're telling the truth. That's usually why truthful statements are shorter than lies. 
mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza, creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva. I think they did it by accident with sedatives um, or accidentally hitting something on her head. Then it makes sense that she believes now more that Madeline's alive than she did then because at the time she knew 100% Madeline was dead because she was there looking at the body. But now she can sort of convince herself, right, or is more distance from, distant from the death. When someone's child goes missing, they maintain hope that they will find their child. But the chances, logically, of the child being dead go up. They don't go down. So that is a weird statement to make. I believe that Madeline is out there. All right, so let's listen again. Right, so she says, now more than before, she believes Madeline is alive. That's leakage. That's another thing you'll see, right, in these um, uh, analyses I do with the McCanns, is they have a ton of leakage. Right. Leakage is when someone reveals the truth through their word choice. And like I said before, because you always speak based on everything you know. So if you speak for long enough, eventually the truth slips out. Lying is very difficult to do. Cool. North Africa. To help us, really. And that's why we've got a new central phone number that people can ring. Um, ¿Mantienen hoy todavía la esperanza? ¿Creen de verdad que Madeleine sigue viva? I do, maybe even more so. I strongly believe that Madeleine is out there. Um, I think she's probably in someone's house. I don't know why. Um, and I suppose it's a feeling, but I feel, as Madeleine's mummy, I feel in my heart really that she's there and I don't, I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us permanently. I don't believe her. I don't feel right. That's also strange, right? I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us. If you take the permanently off that, she's basically saying, I don't believe Madeline has been taken away from us. I don't feel it. I don't know who would harm her. I don't think anybody could harm someone as beautiful as Madeline, and I don't say beautiful as in. So that's also strange, right? I don't think anyone could harm her. If someone took her away from her mom and dad, well, they harmed her, right? They kidnapped her from her bedroom, according to their theory. So they're making lots of bizarre statements, right? I don't believe anyone would harm her. If someone kidnapped her, someone already harmed her. She could be getting harmed right now. And this goes back to what I would say about, so we have leakage there, right? But also regarding the emotion. They look very sullen and down, right, in the way they're speaking. However, their words, they're not reporting emotions that we would expect from parents. Parents of missing children are terrorized by the idea that their child might be getting harmed or even that their child might be missing them, uh, are wondering, you know, what happened to them? Did, did they get abandoned, right? There's a, there's a million things that they are terrorized by. So to say that we're, we don't think she's being harmed by anyone is strange leakage, but also it's reporting emotions that are incorrect, right? It's reporting a lack of emotion. And this is one reason I prefer statement analysis, right, and deception detecting, de detection the way I do it. Um, I prefer that to uh, body language reading because I don't know how a body language analyst would study this. They might be studying her facial expression more than what she's saying and getting tricked by the um, exhibited emotions rather than the reported emotions. 
So people know how to lie with their faces. And why I, I trust statement analysis over something like a lie detector test. Because uh, we will never have the opportunity to sit Kate and Jerry down and put them through a lie detector test. Right? I will never be able to do that to them. However, I can analyze them remotely through their words. And that's why statement analysis is so powerful. And right, if you binge all my videos, you should be picking up these skills. Also, let me know in the comments if you want me to make a course um, for you guys, because I feel like having a handout or something or a cheat sheet, I've had lots of comments at requesting that could be useful. So it's something I could devote some time to. Maybe when we hit 100,000 followers as a celebration um, to bundle up all these lessons. Her appearance, I mean, beautiful as she is, a beautiful little person. And I don't think anybody would harm her. Permítame que les, uh... So once again, I don't think anybody would harm her. That is a strange thing to say. For the mother of a child who has allegedly been kidnapped, right? She says she believes Madeline was kidnapped. Is a strange thing to say. Uh, transporte ahora al pasado a ese día fatídico, al 3 de mayo. ¿Qué es lo último que recuerdan de Madeline? Stop. Right, so what's the last thing you remember about Madeline? That's a good question. Happy little girl. Beautiful, happy little girl. Yes, thank you for all. Beautiful, happy little girl. See, this goes back to um, what I think about the sedatives. Right, both of the parents are doctors. And as you know, usually I don't like to have extraneous information about a subject. I'd like to just listen to the words. However, I do know they're doctors just because it's, it's so famously reported. And I feel like, and I know they were on vacation with another couple. I feel like when they say she was a happy little girl, it means she was loud and boisterous and running around. And, uh, right, I'm not going to put all my poker chips in on this theory, but it is my best hunch right now that she was loud. They used sedatives, perhaps too much sedative on Madeline to put her to sleep so they could go enjoy dinner. And then when they were checking the bedroom, right, I believe if you saw my previous analysis, I believe Jerry found her dying and, uh, and he was the one who di first discovered the body. So I think that when Kate says her last memory of Madeline is a happy, beautiful girl, she's recalling Madeline probably being loud and boisterous and running around and hyper before bedtime, right? Before they administered the sedatives. And right, this is a, this is a big uh, leap right now. But uh, we're trying to polish the details, right? So this is my best theory right now. I'm not going all in betting all my chips on it. I'm just giving you guys my thoughts as I have them. Of all the times, the nice times that we've had in our house and her and playing in the playroom with us. With us. Right, so once again, even Jerry, right? Playing, playing in the playroom. I feel like they're leaking that she was loud and running around before bedtime. Right, because yes, what is your last memory of her? The twins. ¿Creen ustedes que necesitan todavía más la ayuda de desde España? Definitely. I think he's saying, "Do you want more help from Spain or something?" One second. And the playroom with us, with us, the twins. ¿Creen ustedes que necesitan todavía más la ayuda de? Okay, so do you believe you still need help from Spain to find Madeline? Desde España. Definitely. I mean, I think you know the public can help so much. I think. If people know something, if they can um, just, I guess, search the heart, really. Somebody knows something, and they might not realise it, they might just suspect something. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us, we miss her like crazy, but this is Madeline, this is a four-year-old girl. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. You know, Madeline's there, and she needs our help. 
Oh, was that some leakage? She said Madeline is a four-year-old girl. When was this interview done? A few years later? I don't know when this interview was done, but if it was done over a year later, that is strange to say Madeline is a four-year-old girl. That means that Madeline stopped aging. And I actually think Kate corrected herself after she said it. Right? She said, Madeline's a four-year-old girl. And then she said, we haven't seen her since she was four. So that is actually uh, a huge red flag. That actually reveals that they, they do know, that could reveal they do know she's dead, right? So one sign of deception does not mean someone's being deceptive. However, like I, I always say, enough drops can make a flood, right? Enough drops can make a river. And we've already seen in my previous videos on the McCanns plenty of, of drops of deception and leakage. And I think, you know, the public can help so much. I think if people know something, if they can um, just, I guess, search the heart, really. Somebody knows something and they might not realise it. They might just suspect something. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us. We miss it like crazy. But this is Madeline. This is a four-year-old girl. We have Right. This is a four-year-old girl. If this is uh, two or one or two or three years later, she should be saying, Madeline is a five-year-old girl, a six-year-old girl, right? Keeping tabs on her age, celebrating her birthdays while she's missing. If they truly believe she's still out there and can come home. So this is actually um, a bright red flag of leakage. You will not hear the mother of an actual missing child talk about their child as if they permanently stayed the age they were when they were missing. In fact, lots of times they were wondering, you know, um, how, what are they going to look like? How are they growing? Um, how tall is she? Does she look more like me? Right. So they have all these questions. What will they look like? And they even spend uh, right time making posters updating the age, right? It's something that is obsessed about. So this is strange that she says Madeline is a four-year-old girl, and then she, she catches herself and, and corrects it. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. Right. But every, everybody can make a difference to this. It's not about us. We miss her like crazy. But this is Madeline. This is a four-year-old girl. We haven't even seen her since she's been four. Right, so she caught herself. And she used, used extra words, which can be a sign of deception, right? The, the verbiage. We haven't seen her since she was four is a better statement than we haven't even seen her since she was four. You know, Madeline's there and she needs our help. She needs to be with her family, you know. Uh, as parents, we just were asking. As parents for people to try and reunite an innocent four-year-old girl with her parents. So strange. Wow. So Jerry made the same mistake. An innocent four-year-old girl. She's not four anymore, right? Unless she is, right? If she is still four years old, then that's appropriate. However, the interviewer mentioned earlier that it's been six months since the last time they went to the media. So maybe nine months have passed. I don't know if a birthday has passed. But if she is no longer four years old and they're referring to her as a four-year-old girl, that means that their image of her has stopped, right? Their mental image of Madeline is at four years old because she's dead. She's no longer growing. They're no longer curious about what age she might be now because she is no age. She died at four. Right? I hope that makes sense. Ustedes han sido considerados sospechosos por la policía portuguesa, pero hay mucho... All right, so you were considered as suspects by the Portuguese police. Investigadores, sobre todo aquí en el Reino Unido, que mantienen eh, su inocencia. Sin em and you maintain your innocence. Embargo, yo les quería preguntar por sus amigos, por esos siete amigos que estuvieron con ustedes en el Algarve. Confían plenamente en ellos. One hundred percent. I think he's asking, right? Do you uh, believe that the people you were with are also innocent, right? That they're not suspects. One hundred percent. Of everyone. Of our friends, yes. Good question. So this is actually something I 
touched upon in my previous McCann's video. I said it was bizarre, A, that the parents do not accuse each other, right? There's no bickering. For example, you were the one who said we should go down to dinner and leave the kids sleeping in the bedroom. You know, why, why did you do that? Or did you actually check in the bedroom to make sure there wasn't a huge window open when you went to check? Right? So there's no accusations between them, each other. But also, there is no accusations of the other parents, which I said in the previous video was bizarre. Right? They never said, you know, like, we might be family friends, but did you take my daughter? Right? Are you playing some sick joke on me? You know, wh what did you do with Madeline? Right? No accusations. No um, curiosity. Right? Not even bringing up the, the uh, possibility. Whereas a, re a parent of a real missing child would never be so conclusive. All options would be open. And this goes back to this post I did on X. Right? One of the four signs of a coaxer, conclusiveness. So the interviewer asked, is, it, is there no possibility that the other people you were with are the ones who took your daughter? Right? You're sure they're innocent? And listen to the conclusiveness. Right? She says, it's impossible that they did it. Why are hoaxers conclusive? Right? Why is she conclusive about this? Because they know the truth. Right? They're not curious about it because they know what actually happened. And their agenda is to make you believe one story. Right? So if they know they killed Madeline, they're not curious about the friends taking her because they know that didn't happen. They're concerned about making you believe that some random kidnapper who will never get caught stole her because that's their alibi. That's their story and they have to stick to it. So let's listen to her again. Listen to the conclusiveness. Plenamente en ellos. 100%. 100%. 100%. It is impossible that my friends took Madeline. Of everyone. Of our friends, yes. Right. In missing uh, children's cases, parents often get divorced, right? They will turn on each other. But they're not even suspecting their friends, right? That's a giant red flag. It indicates knowledge outside the reported facts. It indicates they know what actually happened. That's why they're not curious about the friends. That's why they're not accusing the friends. That's why they're not accusing each other, right? Did they accuse the hotel staff? I don't know, right? Because ever since they first came out with this, they've been insistent that a kidnapper came through the window and took Madeline. And that insistence on that story and the conclusiveness about it is a giant red flag. And that's why conclusiveness is the first on my list of four signs of a hoaxer. Absolutely. And, but, you know, the same way that we will be eliminated, they will as well. There's no doubt in my mind about that. We are much more optimistic. Right, they will be eliminated as suspects. We have no doubt in our minds. These are people speaking like they know what actually happened because they do. Right, when they were talking about, well, someone knows something, call the phone number, someone has to search their heart, someone might know something. That's how you know all that is ingenuine and scripted. Because when it comes to the friends and each other, there is no searching of the heart or someone might know something, rack your brains. They're, they're conclusive that they had nothing to do with it. Right, so that conclusiveness is a giant red flag. So this is um, a shout out to Rodinas Leves. Great interview. Uh, I'm lucky I speak Spanish though. So I want to give him a shout out for sending this because this has a ton of leakage. Um, let's keep listening. Domestic about what Mr. Ribeiro, the National Director, and Mr. Ribello are saying, that all lines of inquiry are open. And we... Right, all lines of inquiry are open. However, he just contradicted himself by saying 100% it's not the friends. And between each other, it's 100% it wasn't one of us. They checked the bedroom separately. If my kid went missing, as dark and as hard as it would be, I would still have questions about 
the spouse who went and checked on the kid last, right? Are you, are you sure you didn't do something weird, right? You didn't try to play a joke on me. Are you sure you saw Madeline, right? So, and why are they so close? Because they know the truth. They know they're murderers, so they're co-conspirators. That is my theory based on the analysis I've done, right? Then again, I've only watched... Um, that Sklavin interview, which I broke into two parts, and this, and some outside material about the case. We know, because of her, we know we are innocent. We know that she was taken. Once again, the conclusiveness, we know she was taken. That is a giant red flag. We can't really talk in detail about the Arguido status, but I, the way I... I think he's just saying that they're, they're under suspicion. I understand it is the Arguido status is to give, defend your own rights. So if the police want to ask questions, difficult questions, they have to make the Arguido. So that, that in itself isn't a problem. We have not been charged with anything. The investigation continues and we will be eliminated. And the key thing is, Madeline is out there. And everyone... Mm, and as traumatic as it's been, it's secondary. It really is secondary. I'll take anything that's thrown at me, but number one is getting my daughter back, without doubt. Anything that's thrown at me. Stuff like that is why I think Madeline might have been hit on the head with something. All right, this is uh, right, a huge leap based on that little bit of leakage. But I think something's triggering in my brain about the previous ones. I think they use some language like throwing um, or hitting. Right, If we did a deep dive statement analysis breakdown, we would discover lots more leakage. That's why I think the comments on the videos are so good because if we watch these videos five times, we will find five different layers of leakage. So that's why I try to read, I do read every single comment, even if I don't reply to every single comment. So if you find more instances of violent language like that, right? Like we'll take anything that's thrown at me or even Jerry, right? We will be eliminated. These are weird choices of words. But without enough of them, it's a big leap, right? So these are the only two I've keyed on to right now. But it's triggering something in my memory. Se consideran en parte condenados ya en un juicio paralelo por la opinión pública o por una proporción importante de la opinión pública y por también una parte de los medios. I think it's hard. Um, if people... I think they're saying like, do you consider the public opinion, the opinion of the media? People are reading every day that someone has done something or is guilty of something, it's hard to ignore it. But, you know, we've always said, always said that, you know, we will wait for the facts and, and to look at what the, the official and, statements are saying. And that, that scenario hasn't changed. Um, I don't know how some of the things have been published. Uh, and we've asked for responsible reporting. Um, and we still ask for that. But the key thing for us is finding out where Madeline is. Hay mucha gente en España que se pregunta si unos padres que son injustamente acusados de la desaparición de su hija no deberían reaccionar de una forma más airada, no tan fría. After being made a guido. I think you're saying that you come off as cold as parents who are accused. I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we know the truth. I know I'm innocent. Jerry knows he's innocent. We know each other are innocent. And that, to me, it, it was actually quite calm because I thought... See, it is strange, right? Like I said, the conclusive. We know the truth. I know I'm innocent. At that stage, that's if you are innocent, that's the only thing you know. Because you were going back and forth checking the room. You don't know if the other spouse is innocent, and you definitely don't know if the other friends are innocent. So the conclusiveness of what they say, the only conclusive thing you could say is, I'm innocent. That would be appropriate. I am innocent. But to say conclusively that the other spouse is innocent, uh, I mean, obviously you would expect them to do that in, in the public. 
but they do it constantly, and uh, they're so insistent on the other one that that uh, it's it's extremely conclusive, which is a red flag for hoaxers, right? If it were the only red flag, we would dismiss it, but there's tons of other red flags. So we're innocent, we're totally innocent, and we know that. And I think as well that you've got to remember it was um, it was over. Also, like they say, we're totally innocent. When a child goes missing, parents blame themselves for not being better, right? As crazy as it is, right? Even if they did everything right, if their kid goes missing, they say, well, you know, I, I, maybe I should have uh, put more security systems in the house, right? Or I should have walked them home from school every day. So they, they have doubts about themselves, right? Uh, and these parents, right, did do something... I don't know if it rises to the level of child neglect because, well, you know, if you believe the true story, right? At the very least, they admitted they left the uh, infants sleeping in a bedroom alone while they ate dinner, uh, you know, at the other part of the resort. And if you believe their story, they should still feel bad about, well, maybe, you know, we shouldn't have left them in there, right? So there would be some level of self-blame and self-questioning. But here, because they know they're guilty, they have to persuade you that they are 100% innocent. They can leave no room for doubt, right? Their life depends on, make, on convincing you that they're innocent. So they leave no wiggle room, um, no option that they did it, no option that they may have been a little bit neglectful, um, even in the choice of friends they brought with them, right? So it's that conclusiveness and that persuasiveness that that we are certain we are innocent, we did nothing wrong, that insistence is the, is a red flag. Four months since Madeline disappeared. It's like when uh, Bob Gimley, the guy who allegedly took the video of Bigfoot, was asked, could it not have been someone tricking you, some person wearing a costume? And he said, no, impossible. That's how you know it's a hoax. That's how you know he's a hoaxer. Because of course it's possible someone could be fooling him. In fact, that's far more likely. It is far more likely that it was an elaborate hoax. Or Chris Grush, when he was asked, uh, you know, is it possible that the UFOs you're reading about are simply aircrafts made by other government departments that don't communicate with each other? And he said, no, that's impossible. Right? That conclusiveness is the hallmark of a hoaxer. Of course it's possible. And if you're telling the truth, you would entertain that possibility because your goal is to get to the truth. If you're lying, your goal is to convince every single person about the story you're trying to get across. There can be no room for doubt. Disappeared, And nothing, nothing that's happened to us in this time right. has come close to upsetting us the way we felt when we discovered Madeline missing. When we discovered Madeline missing, it is a weird phrase, but I feel like I use it myself too sometimes when I'm describing this, right? But it is weird to say that you discovered something that wasn't there, right? It's more appropriate to say when I noticed Madeline was missing or when we realized Madeline was gone. The more uh, appropriate grammatical thing is when we discovered Madeline dead. Makes more grammatical sense. Claro que van a seguir buscando a Madeline, que creen que puede estar en España y que necesitan ayuda de los españoles. Pero mientras tanto continúa la investigación policial y se espera que se hagan públicas unas pruebas de ADN que les podrían incriminar. ¿Cómo esperan? ¿Cómo viven esa espera? ¿Con miedo, con inquietud, con esperanza? Well, they're not going to show anything to implicate us, so I'm not... I think he's talking about that they allegedly found some DNA in a rental car. And he's saying, you know, uh, how do you feel about that? You know, are you worried about it? You know, I'm not concerned, if I'm honest. We're certainly not scared, you know. There she uses that if I'm honest thing again. So he asked about the DNA in the car. And she said, I'm not concerned if I'm honest. So if 
we go back and we look at every time she says, if I'm honest, right? Every time she uses that verbal crutch. If she's lying every time she uses it, that means she is concerned about the DNA. Like I said, if these videos do well, we'll do a deep dive into this. Because as I say in each of these videos, there's so much leakage with these parents. If we actually spent enough time on it, we I think we could piece together everything. You know, if there is anything in the DNA results, and we don't know them, and we, we cannot know them, and I don't believe anyone in the press knows them either, but there is nothing in those DNA tests related to Kate and I that will show anything other than completely innocent. Um, Interesting. So are they worried that Madeline's DNA will show up? Because right, he's saying there's nothing that will show Kate in my DNA. It will show guilt, but he excluded Madeline. And this goes back to something I said in the last video, when they mentioned in the video that they got a rental car after Madeline was quote unquote taken. And I speculated that they may have put Madeline in the car and taken her to the ocean based on the leakage. So if you haven't seen the other two videos I've done, you should go uh, watch those after this. Make sure to subscribe because I'm sure YouTube will serve them up into your feed. But in that one, we basically theorized, and this seems to support that theory, that Madeline was given sedatives, which killed her. Uh, Jerry found her. He and his wife concocted the story of the kidnapper. And then they took Madeline and put her in the ocean. And then when I heard about them bringing up the rental car, um, I theorized that they may have put her in the trunk of the car and drove her to the ocean. And now they're sort of leaking that uh, they are worried about that DNA based on Kate's verbal crutch, right? If I'm being honest, I'm not concerned. And Jerry, right? There will be no DNA from me and Kate, excluding Madeline, right? So he's leaving open the possibility that maybe Madeline's DNA will be in there. Whether that is enough to eliminate us, I don't know, but we will be eliminated. I'm confident of that because we have done nothing. Hay mucha gente que piensa que ustedes eh, son inocentes. Hay gente que sí. Also, notice how we left off the word we've done nothing wrong. Dropped words are something you should be attuned to. Lots of times people will say a sentence um, when they're lying in hope that you just imply, you infer the rest of the sentence. Like we saw with Nadia when she was doing the lie detector. The lie detector guy asked her, have you ever cheated on a partner? And Nadia said, never cheated. Right, leaving off the pronoun I, I've never cheated. Never cheated does not mean anything. Saying we've never done anything is not the same as saying we never done anything wrong. So these dropped words should also be red flags. Like I say, there are so many layers to their leakage. We could find a lot here if we broke it down in depth. That's why I think your comments are valuable because you will notice stuff on your second watch or third watch that I did not notice on this watch. Right, this is all the high level stuff I'm noticing in real time. And those DNA tests related to Kate and I that will show anything other than completely innocent. Um, whether that is enough to eliminate us, I don't know, but we will be eliminated. I'm confident of that because we have done nothing. Right, we have done nothing. Hay mucha gente que piensa que ustedes eh, son inocentes. Hay gente que sigue queriendo ayudarles. Y sobre todo hay mucha gente que, independientemente de lo que piensen de ustedes, quieren que Madeleine aparezca viva. So he's saying, right, there's lots of people who think that you're innocent, who want you to get Madeleine home alive. ¿Qué les diría a esa gente? ¿Qué men what do you tell those people? mensaje les transmitiría a los españoles ahora mismo? Right, what message do you want to give to those people? Yes, please help us. Please help us as a family. Please help Please help us. If your daughter is missing, what would you say? If my daughter was missing, I would say, please help Madeline. But listen to their priority. Please help us. This is the type of leakage I'm talking about where this is, uh, this is why people suspected them from day one. Because this sort of leakage 
even if you don't know exactly what's hitting you the wrong way, can be detected instinctively. If your daughter's missing, the message you give out is, please help Madeline. Wanted, Madeline, not please help us. When you say please help us, you're basically leaking that you know Madeline is already beyond the need for help. She's dead. Please help us find Madeline. Please help Madeline. So, oh, now she corrects herself. All right, so. Les transmitiría a los españoles. All right, so listen to her first answer. Also realize that, and we saw this in the previous interview, they say some stuff correctly, and then they also say stuff incorrectly. When you're telling the truth, these inconsistencies don't happen. At least they don't happen this often because you're telling the truth. What happens with liars is they say some stuff correctly because they're conscious that they're lying and they want to say the right thing. Like, for example, always referring to Madeline in the present tense, except for when they admit, you know, we'll never be happy again. So they contradict themselves, right? If she's still alive and you're referring to her in the present tense, you may be happy again. She might get found. Or here, what is the one message you want to give? Please help us. And then she catches herself. Please help Madeline. So listen again. It's please help us. Please help us as a family. Please help us find Madeline. Right, so there you go. Please help us. Please help us as a family. And finally, please help us find Madeline. Please help Madeline. And then finally, right, so it took her five attempts to say the thing the real a mother of a real missing child would say, which is please help Madeline. So like I said, these are not good liars. A good liar would be able to get that right and maybe in two attempts, right? It wouldn't take five attempts. Please, if you know any information at all or you suspect anything, no matter how small. And look at how they contradict themselves, right? If you know anything, any information at all, right? So they're asking for all these tidbits of information all the way in Spain and Sweden. However, when it comes to the people who were there with them, their friends who are checking on the kids in the bedrooms, 100% no, they didn't do it. There's zero curiosity about them, right? We don't need any tidbits about them. That is another contradiction, right? So this is how they, lots of people pick up on this instinctively, but it's also how some people get fooled because they listen to all the correct things that they're saying, right? Well, she did say, please help Madeline. Yes, she did. After five variations, and the first one of which was, please help us. And that first variation was not, please help us find Madeline. It was, please help us, and please help us as a family. Then finally, please help us find Madeline. Or maybe it was four attempts, right? And then, please help Madeline. Something along those lines, right? It took three or four attempts. But if someone's not paying attention to what's actually being said, they miss all the screw-ups and, and only listen to what they expect to hear. Right? They expect her to say the right thing, so that's all they hear. So that's another critical skill just in life in general. Listen to what is actually being said. If someone implies something, that's not the same as someone declaring it. So if someone doesn't actually say, if someone doesn't say, I didn't cheat on the video game, don't put those words into their mouth, right? Or if they, uh, right, if they don't say, my daughter is missing, then don't put those words into their mouth. Small, please, you know, just find it in yourself, really. Have that courage to make that call to the new number. Strange. It's like she's talking to herself. Find it in yourself. Right, what are these random Spanish people supposed to find in themselves? please, you know, just find it in yourself, really. Have that courage to make that call to the new number. It's almost like she's looking in the mirror, talking to herself. And help us bring Madeline home. Jerry, hay también mucha gente que considera que quizás ya 
Habría llegado el momento, después de estos meses, de mantener la esperanza y seguir la búsqueda, pero desde un ámbito un poquito más privado. ¿Todo este entorno eh, mediático de asesores que tiene no les perjudica? High risk or aggressive, the strategy for us is we have waited and been incredibly patient. Clearly, the media attention has never gone away. Yeah. It's never I mean, gone away. We haven't spoken for long, and you know, and, day uh, after day, Madeline's in the paper, we're on the front page, and we've said nothing. Permítame que ya en los minutos finales de la entrevista les haga algunas preguntas sobre algunas cuestiones de de aquella noche. All right, so I think Soradinas told me in his ex post to me that at 11.36 they're confronted with the theory of using sedatives, which is a theory I believe. So I think that's going to come up here. So right now he's saying, you know, allow me to ask a question in these final minutes about a theory. De la noche del 3 de mayo. Or rather, about that night. ¿Qué es lo último que recuerdan de Madeleine ese día? Once again... What is the last thing you remember about Madeline? So they've already answered this question before in this interview and in previous interviews. So let's listen to what they say now. A little bit like I mentioned before, she was very happy um, and very loving. And, you know, I know Madeline was very happy with her life. Madeline was very happy with her life. Like I said, I think she was being loud that night and running around and being hyper, keeping the twins up. And they used the sedative to put her to sleep. They used too much. And uh, she died in the bedroom. She's special. <sighs> Usted, Kate, estuvo, fue la última que la vio, ¿verdad? Porque... You said, Kate, you were the last one to see her alive. Jerry estaba jugando tenis, creo, ¿no es así? Because Jerry was playing tennis. Mm. I, I saw I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was and how lucky I was. To... So he said almost this exact same phrase in multiple interviews now, right? I saw her, I thought how beautiful she was. The father of three children. I thought how lucky I was. Let's listen to his answer again, because I'm going to point out some huge leakage here. Hold on. I, I, saw, I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was and how lucky I was to be. So when you're recounting something you thought, for example, if I was holding a puppy, I would say I thought how cute it is, how happy it is. Now, if I'm talking about a puppy that just got run over and I pick it up, I'll say, I thought how cute it was, how happy it was, because the puppy's dead now, right? It's past tense. I'm relaying the thoughts I had at that time. So if I'm looking at a cute little puppy, I'm saying how cute it is, right? I remember how cute it is, right? I thought to myself, this is so cute, so fun. If it's dead, I would say, I... I You know, I was so sad. I thought to myself how cute it was. It was so fun, right? Past tense. So look, even as he's recounting this thought he had, it's in the past tense. The father of three children. Mm -hmm. I, I, saw, I saw it and um, I thought how beautiful she was. Right, how beautiful she was. I think what he's revealing here is the last time he saw her, she was dead. So he did think, you know, he's being honest here. The last time I saw her, I thought how beautiful she was. And how lucky I was. How lucky I was, right? I was lucky. I had the perfect family. To be father of three children. Right? How lucky I was to be the father of three children. Because now I'm the father of two children. Right? It's past tense. I am no longer the father of three children. So the tense is another thing you should always listen for. Right, this he is, in my opinion, relaying honestly the last time he saw Madeline, and the thoughts he had, 
the last time he saw her, right? I was very lucky. I was the father of three kids and she was very beautiful, but not anymore, right? I'm not lucky anymore. She's dead now. She was a very beautiful little girl and I'm no longer the father of three children. I'm the father of two children now. I... Also, even if you think they are killers, it's still a tragic tale, right? It's a tragedy either way. I think they did it by accident. That's also why I don't like covering true crime too much, right? Because this stuff is heavy. I would rather talk about um, sadists like Jada Pinkett Smith or even Ruby Frankie than talk about um, dead children. Una teoría que se extendió en la prensa y es que pudo haber sido un accidente. All right, so here's the question. Could it have been an accident that night? Father of three children. Hay una teoría que se extendió en la prensa y es que... All right, so here we go. This is the money shot question. That night, could it have been an accident? Right? Could you have killed Madeline by accident? And now let's listen to the response they give because I think this will be a major clue into understanding what happened that night. Pudo haber sido un accidente por una sedación de los niños. Ustedes han negado reiteradas veces que jamás dieran calmantes o médicos los dos. Jamás. Okay, so he's saying, so in the past you do admit to having given them something to calm them down, right? Sedatives. Dieran calmantes a sus hijos para dormirles. You know, I'm not... Right, you admitted to giving your kids sedatives to put them to sleep. I'm not even going to answer that question, I'm afraid. I mean, it's ludicrous. And wow. I'm not even going to answer that question. I'm afraid. That is leakage. She basically just said she's afraid to answer that question. Why? Because it's the truth. Now look at the mockery. We've never seen Jerry get this riled up about a question. And... You know, these sort of it's ridiculous, right? Mockery is another sign of a liar. Which is why when um, I see mockery, it's weak, right? It means you have doubt. It's not elite. It's not an elite way to speak. It's how people who have secret doubts speak, which is why I don't like mockery in general, but also it's a sign of a liar. So I'm not going to even answer that, I'm afraid. If you didn't do it that night, why not say, no, of course, we did not do it that night. No, we did not use said as on her. Instead, she says, I, I'm not going to answer that. I'm afraid. She's leaking, right? Her brain is leaking the truth. She's afraid. She is afraid to answer that question. You know, I'm not even going to answer that question, I'm afraid. I mean, it's ludicrous. And, you know, these... What's so ludicrous about it? Why is it ludicrous to suspect something that's totally reasonable and that they've admitted to using sedatives on their children in the past to put them to sleep? It's, it's actually very far from ludicrous. It's actually more believable than a kidnapper randomly coming in and taking their child. So it's the furthest thing from ludicrous. These sort of questions and the publishing of them are nonsense and we shouldn't be giving them the time of day. There is mm. absolutely no suggestion um, that Madeline or the children were drugged. Right, so he actually leaked a little bit, right, that Madeline was drugged, because I think only Madeline was drugged. And it's outrageous. Well, I'm going to say is... Also, he never denied it, right? He never said it never happened. He just said there's no suggestion of it. And this goes back to it being very difficult to lie. This is how we caught Nadia cheating on war zones. It's how we caught Liver King lying about taking steroids. It's how we've caught lots of liars. By weak denials. If you're telling the truth, you can deny things easily. Because you're telling the truth. But it is surprisingly difficult for people to deny things that they've done. And like we've seen here, Jerry and Kate are not sophisticated liars. So they can't actually say that they didn't do it. The most they can do is imply it, right? There's no suggestion that happened. 
well, you would know. So you could just tell us it didn't happen, right? But he can't do that. Right? So there's no suggestion it happened. So notice how there is no denial. It's not a reliable denial. And if you want to see the difference between a reliable and an unreliable denial, watch my most watched video. It has I think like a quarter of a million views on YouTube. What does a reliable denial look like? And you will see a stark contrast to this, which is a weak denial. Okay. There is absolutely no suggestion um, that Madeline... Or right, so absolutely, so an intensifier. To a simple question, right, was it possible? That's why it goes back to what I say about intensifiers. No suggestion. Well, if you didn't do it, you could say you didn't do it. You don't need to rely on extraneous suggestions and evidence. You could just tell us it didn't happen. Or the children were drugged, and it's outrageous. Well, I'm going to say is I'm Madeline's mummy. I know she was taken from that apartment and she's out there. Wow. So they're getting desperate at this question. All I know is Madeline was taken, right? So straight back to the alibi. So they're not even on offense anymore, right? Now they're going on to defense. They're directing the interview now. She was taken. I'm her mommy. I She was taken. So I, this does indicate that we might be onto the right theory. I think that they gave her a sedative because look how anxious they are about this. All of a sudden we're into mockery. We're into trying to direct to the conversation, right? To get off the topic. We're onto everything a hoaxer does, right? They're conclusive now. She was taken without denying that they drugged her, right? So there was no denial that they did it. You know, even if we did drug her, she was taken. Vagueness, reticence, they don't want to talk about this. So this is um, this is a money shot of an interview for sure. He asked the right question and they're displaying all the signs of a liar. They don't want to talk about it, right? They refuse to even answer the question. And when they get close to answering it, they don't even make a direct denial, right? Even Jerry didn't say they didn't do it. He just said, we shouldn't give this the time of day. Right? There's no suggestion. Imagine if your spouse came, came up to you and said, did you, did you cheat on me last week? And you say, there is no suggestion that I cheated on you last week. What would they think? Would that be satisfactory? Of course not, right? Because it's not a denial. Or, you know, or if, if your spouse said, did you cheat on me last week? And you say, you know what? We shouldn't even be giving this the time of day. I'm not going to talk about this. That would be a huge red flag, right? So when you think about it in other more relatable contexts, you can see how wild the res these responses are, right? Did you cheat on me? That's ludicrous. You're ludicrous. You're crazy, right? That is a huge red flag, right? So whenever you think that, you know, I'm making a giant leap, try putting it into a different context. Right, I could put this into a hundred different contexts to illustrate it, but I think that illustrates it, right? So just imagine asking someone something and then reacting in this way regarding that question, and you'll understand how ludicrous it is. Right, there, go, there we go with that word. It's stuck in my head now. You'll understand how crazy it is to answer that way. And I want to back. I mean, that, that is all. I mean, everything else, I'm sorry, is rubbish. Siguen hoy ustedes. Rubbish. I think it's more leakage, right? I think, um, like I said, I think they disposed of Madeline in the ocean. They may have wrapped her in a trash bag. The words they're choosing here when they're shaken up are very important. This is probably one of the most dense interviews I've ever covered on the channel with the amount of leakage that we're getting. And one reason why I think if we watched enough interviews in and up enough depth, we would get to the bottom of this case, right? As unbelievable as it sounds. Um, right. So this is, we're 12 and a half minutes into a 13 minute interview and I've been on recording for over an hour, right? That just shows you how dense this interview is. 
And uh, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share my videos so we can get more eyes onto it, which means more people adding to the comments. And basically, the way I pick the videos I'm going to cover are by which ones do well in the YouTube algorithm. So that helps boost them in the algorithm when you drop relevant comments, uh, like them, subscribe, and share them. Ustedes dos, igual de unidos en el terreno personal, igual de unidos que antes de la desaparición de Madeline, o más unidos todavía. What do you think? So he's saying, are you closer together now that Madeline's gone? <laughs> Very close. See, and this interviewer is asking good questions. Right? It's actually hitting on lots of the points I made in the previous video. Lots of parents of missing children bicker, end up getting divorced. Right? They can't even look at each other. But they're saying they're closer, which goes to my theory that they're co-conspirators, right? They cooked up this alibi about the kidnapper together, and now they are bound for life. And they even talk about themselves as a we, right? Never I. It's always we, right? They are they are stuck together for life. We're completely together in this, and we're united in the search for Madeline, her, her daughter. Right, we're together in this. What's this? The murder of Madeline. Right, this ordeal we're going through right now, trying to get away with murder. We're together. We're united. Desde aquel día, en todo este tiempo, casi seis meses, ¿hay algo de lo que ustedes se arrepientan? ¿Algo que crean que no hicieron bien? Okay, another great question. Is there anything that you regret? Now, the parent of a missing child would not be conclusive. Right, conclusiveness is one of the signs of a hoaxer. The parent of a missing child would probably, would admit some of the faults, right? I, I, I'm kicking myself for leaving her alone in that room. I wish I'd never went on vacation, right? They would be filled with regrets, right? Their life would consist of regrets, even if they didn't do anything wrong. A hoaxer would leave no room for doubt. They would minimize their regrets because, hey, we didn't do anything wrong. Someone broke in and took Madeline. There's nothing we could have done about it. Don't even look at me as a suspect. So let's see how they answer. Not from the minute we found her gone. Pues muchísimas gracias por... Wow. Textbook, right? No regrets. We anticipated that one. It's always nice when you make a prediction about what someone's going to say, and then they say it. Haber hablado con nosotros para Antena 3 Televisión. Y lo que sí les podemos asegurar es que desde España hay millones de personas que desean... So now they're wrapping up the interview. Con mucha fuerza. Que Madeleine... Let me know if you want to see more of the Madeleine McCann case. Until next time, stay true.